Today, we are excited to hear from Zhao Wendong on network-based learning for understanding collective human behavior. He's a lecturer in the Department of Engineering here at okay, Oxford and a former postdoc at MIT Media one. Lab, where he is still an affiliate. Um, Zhao Wen works with graphs to model relational structure of data and develop new technologies that sit at the intersection of machine learning, uh, signal processing, and complex networks. So it's kind of a cool opportunity. We've touched quite a bit peripherally on mentioning networks, but now we're going to get to hear a little bit more in depth. Um, and we're also lucky to be creating, speaking of networks, a little bit of triadic closure here, because at MIT Media Lab, um, he was in Sandy Petland's lab, which several friends and former members of, of the six in, former, in other years, and speakers this year, like Abdullah, mm -hmm. speaking at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're creating friends of a friend of a friend here. So um, yeah, thank you very much. We're excited. Yeah, thank you. So I hope this, this is OK. You can hear me. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and also um, to talk about some recent stuff that we did. So I'm in engineering here technically, so which means I have an engineering background. So uh, that means when I talk about computational social science, uh, definitely I'm more on the computational side rather than the social side. So I will not pretend to be a social scientist here. Um, so if I make any imprecise statement, please forgive me. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I think it's good to present some recent work uh, that we have done to um, um, apply computational approaches to understand collective human behavior, um, which I hope will bring some uh, fresh ideas from a more computational learning perspective, uh, which will be complementary to uh, the traditional approaches. Uh, so for this reason, please feel free to, to interrupt uh, during the presentation if you have any uh, questions or comments. Uh, I would be happy to, to answer. Uh, so, yeah, this works. So, since we are uh, in this uh, summer institute for uh, computational social science, I thought it would be good for us to first uh, look at a few historical developments in applying computational methods uh, to understand the society and the behavior. Uh, and, and you will see most of the, uh, many ideas were actually originated from uh, the field of physics. Um, so, in early uh, 19th century, uh, inspired by uh, Newtonian physics, uh, society was conceptualized as a machine. Um, and um, August Comte was regarded as the father of uh, sociology by many people. Uh, at that time, defined the concept of social physics uh, as the study of the uh, laws of societies and the, uh, the science of mm -hmm. the uh, civilization. So in fact, the term t uh, sociology uh, was invented by uh, Comte uh, to uh, designate the concept of uh, social physics. Um, so if we want to study the laws of society, then we need information and uh, uh, what we call data today. Uh, so at the same time, uh, to be precise, in 1834, uh, the uh, London Statistical Society, uh, Statistical Society of London was founded, uh, which eventually became the Royal Statistical Society in our days, uh, with the aim to uh, procure, arrange, and publish facts to illustrate the conditions and the uh, uh, prospects of society. Uh, so that was uh, the origin of uh, data collection. But uh, in Victorian times, the way that we collect data was basically to, to go to different villages in this uh, uh, country uh, and then uh, to collect uh, somewhat uh, disconnected and fragmented pieces of information. So they were not uh, good enough for us to uh, illustrate the whole picture of the society, uh, let alone to build computational models to understand the the, the, the behavior of people. Um, so this is kind of the first wave of studies. The, the second wave took place in uh, the mid-20th uh, century. And again, the concept of social physics was uh, reinvented. Uh, there was actually a, a research group uh, called Department of Social Physics uh, in uh, Princeton uh, in mid-1950s. It existed for 20 years or something. Um, so the main drivers of this uh, wave was that uh, many uh, social indicators have been found to have statistical regularities, uh, such as the uh, zip distribution or uh, gravity law. Uh, so zip distribution is one type of power law distribution, uh, which was uh, popularized by um, 
think the American linguist uh, George Ziff, uh, who studied the uh, distribu uh, distribution of the frequencies of the words in a document, and he found that the frequencies of a word in a document is uh, pro uh, inverse pro uh, proportional to the uh, rank of the word in the frequency table. So that means the most frequent word appears uh, two times as many uh, as often as the uh, second most frequent, and three times as many as the uh, third fre uh, frequent. And the same uh, distribution uh, has been discovered for other indicators, such as the populations uh, of cities in uh, countries uh, or uh, income distribution. Um, so gravity law is another example, which was also kind of uh, proposed by Azif, uh, who studied the uh, intercity movement uh, in the United States. So he, he uh, discovered that the number of people who move between uh, two different communities in the United States uh, is proportional to the population of the two communities, uh, but inversely proportional to the transportation distance between them. So like P1, P2 divided by D, so hence the name uh, gravity uh, law. Uh, so, and then more recently, the third wave uh, emerges, uh, where furthermore people find the statistical regularities uh, also within human movement uh, and, and uh, communication. So examples could be concepts such as uh, uh, triadic uh, closure, so how people form uh, groups or uh, join groups or form ties. If A is a friend of both B and C, then B and C are likely to be a friend in future. Uh, other concepts could be strong and weak ties. Uh, so these were the ideas originally proposed by uh, Grano Vetter in the 70s. Uh, so he was basically saying that uh, the, the links of a person in a social network can be divided in roughly two groups, the strong ties, which are close friends, and the weak ties, which are uh, distant acquaintances. So uh, the, the weak ties in this case essentially are uh, like uh, links uh, between uh, uh, that span the boundaries of different uh, communities or groups. Uh, which he believed uh, to be essential to uh, exchange of information and creation of new economic opportunities. So as a consequence, uh, people who maintain more these uh, weak ties are likely to be more successful in their uh, career. Uh, the same idea has been tested at the community level uh, in a study in 2010 by Eagle. Uh, so they basically looked at <laughs> the uh, communication network uh, of uh, communities across the whole country of UK and then they uh, find the, a very strong uh, uh, correlation between the uh, diversity of the community, uh, of the com uh, communication patterns of the communities and the socioeconomic status. Um, so this paper itself has also some criticism, but I think it's one of the first studies that try to test these ideas at the national level, uh, which is good. But, but the limitations of this kind of uh, work would be um, mostly uh, we, we don't really study the mechanism behind the social interactions or, or what is the cause of, of the observed uh, statistical regularities, uh, which could be due to a lack of appropriate data uh, or computational methods to do so. Uh, so both things change uh, dramatically uh, more recently. So uh, since 10 years ago, we have more and more data about human behavior. So you can think about social media, location data, uh, data that are collected by uh, pervasive technologies such as mobile phones and credit cards. Uh, so one thing about this type of data is that they're passively collected, so they're not like obtained by a survey, so potentially they contain less personal bios, uh, because usually the data are not collected the, uh, where the people uh, were uh, actually uh, knowing that they're actively being collected. collected. And also, of course, they are uh, easy to scale to the population uh, uh, scale. Uh, so at the same time, we obviously have more advanced computational methods. Uh, you probably uh, uh, heard about uh, machine learning or deep learning, these kind of techniques uh, that can uh, allow us to uh, make the best out of the data that we, we have. Uh, so the combination of these two basically leads to uh, computational social science, uh, in my uh, view, uh, which uh, gives a few new perspectives uh, in social science studies. So we can obviously think about moving away from uh, static information collected by uh, uh, surveys to the actual behavior of the people. So from demographics, uh, age, gender, to the actual behavior of the people. Uh, and also from uh, a single person to a connected network. So you're not just looking at individuals separately, but you look at how they uh, behave collectively. Um, you look at this uh, relationship between different people in a dynamic way, which means that the relationship can evolve over time. And obviously, you, you can easily look at a much larger population. So 
the practical impact of that could be, if we think about most current population management solutions, uh, they are mostly focused on demographics, individual records, and the static information. We think about how banks give credit limits to, to you or the network providers, they, they give you deals about uh, mobile phone contracts. It's mostly about your uh, individual records uh, uh, in history uh, without looking at uh, a kind of a, a network of people. Uh, so the new way could be to actually look at the actual behavior of people in a collective way and also uh, dynamically. Uh, but these, of course, uh, uh, need more uh, uh, models and methods uh, because we need to understand better the structures and the complexities. And, and this also poses challenges in developing uh, advanced computational methods uh, in the context of social science research. So the uh, topic today will mostly be this part. So how we uh, move from individual behavior to collective behavior, because I think that will be uh, something important to understand, also uh, interesting to understand. Um, so I will focus on two uh, pieces of studies. I will split the talk equally, more or less. Uh, the first question is how social network will affect decision making. So we all know that, for example, if I tell you something about a, a restaurant, maybe you are likely to go uh, sometime <laughs> in the future. So that's like an influence. Uh, but how this uh, influence propagates in social network is an interesting and open question. Uh, second, uh, in many cases, we don't observe a social network. We just observe the uh, decisions that are taken by people. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see if we can do the, uh, solve the reverse problem. Uh, we observe the actions, and now we try to infer the connections between them uh, so that we can understand the communities, etc. Uh, so I will first talk about the, 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 the first question. Uh, so the kind of motivation here uh, is, is basically we, we all know that uh, 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 nowadays, uh, we live in a connected society. Uh, um, even people who are uh, very, very far away are connected uh, via a few hopes of uh, acquaintances. And these uh, ideas of uh, the six degrees of separation was mostly uh, first uh, realized uh, by uh, Milgram's experiment in the 70s. What he did is just to ask a person uh, in, who lives in uh, somewhere in the US, Nebraska, uh, to, to send a letter to somebody in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the rule is just to send the letter to uh, one of the people they, uh, the, the sender knows. Uh, so eventually, he did a study, and then eventually, I think 25% of the letters arrived. Uh, but among the uh, letters that arrived, uh, the average hope that took is like 5.5. Uh, so that was uh, one of the original experiments that uh, gave the idea of six degrees of separation. And, but we are not just connected in the society in a uh, like, uh, actual way. But actually, we also influence each other if we are connected. So uh, there, there is several studies uh, by uh, Chris Takis and uh, Fowler that look at the, the spreading of behaviors, a uh, certain type of phenomenon in the social network, such as the obesity, happiness, or smoking behavior. And uh, they find that this kind of uh, behavior can spread to three hopes away uh, from you. So three hopes away, if you think about it, it may be a person that you don't even know uh, in some cases. So uh, the uh, thing that remains open is how this uh, influence uh, propagates in the social network uh, scenario. Uh, so how uh, my uh, decision will be affected by you uh, if I received some information from you. Uh, and especially in the offline setting, uh, there are a few studies on, in the online setting, like Facebook, uh, these kind of platforms. But offline settings are difficult because um, it's not easy uh, usually to carry out a, a large scale offline uh, experiment. Um, and uh, we also need uh, more advanced methods uh, compared to the traditional RCT-based methods to, to basically quantify the influence. So that's basically the motivation of this uh, study. Uh, we, we looked at a particular uh, um, data set, uh, which is a, a mobile phone data set collected during an uh, international event called uh, Cirque du Soleil. It's basically a performance event in uh, many countries. This one is in Andorra uh, in Europe. Uh, so it took place every uh, July, I think. Uh, lasts for the whole month. Uh, so basically, we try to uh, ask the question uh, how influence on uh, uh, how so, uh, social influence can play a role in uh, an individual decision making in the sense that whether or not to attend this event. Uh, is likely to be uh, uh, affected by the fact that uh, you receive a phone call from an attendee, uh, or maybe somebody who has been contacted by the attendee. Uh, 
uh, these are just some uh, basic statistics that I will explain uh, further. The, uh, the setting that we have uh, is quite intuitive. So we build an information cascade. So it's basically a phone communication network. Uh, for a given uh, observational period, you can take one day, uh, if you like. Uh, so the idea here is that, let's say we have uh, Anne, who is, who is the initial adopter, so he attended the event. Uh, and then after that, within this uh, observa uh, observational period, we observe that she uh, made a phone calls to three other people, Casey, Daniel, and Bob. So these people, uh, after receiving the uh, call from Anne, they will further uh, make calls to the other people. Uh, so this is basically the information cascade that we define. Um, here, we basically define the shortest distance between any uh, person uh, to the original adopter uh, as a hop index. So you can see uh, Bob, Casey, and Daniel, they are one hop away, uh, and all the other people are two hop away. Uh, the people who have never been connected uh, in this uh, information cascade are the people who are outside. So in that sense, we define all these people to be influenced and the people outside are not influenced, basically. Uh, so then we can observe whether uh, all the rest of the people uh, will uh, uh, make adoption, in this case, attend <laughs> the event uh, for the rest of the uh, month, basically. Uh, so this is the basic setup. Mm. But one uh, technical challenge in this case would be uh, the decisions on adoption, or a lot of things, may be uh, attributed to two factors usually. One is called homophily, the other is influence. The homophily is basically, uh, it means that uh, uh, a friendship is more likely to be formed between people who share uh, certain characteristics. In this case, so if two people like music, uh, then they're likely to form a link between them uh, instead of uh, between a person who likes music and a person who likes books. Uh, that's the basic idea, how uh, links can be formed. Uh, so. Uh, that means if we observe that uh, these two people, they both attend, let's say this is the attendee, and then uh, after the phone call, this person goes, then we, we are not really sure whether that uh, person uh, goes because uh, of the uh, phone call, because it might be that they are just uh, uh, both interested in music by default. Uh, so it's kind of a, um, a bias that is caused by this concept of, of homophily. So if we really want to quantify the influence of a phone call, um, which is the kind of treatment in our case, then we need to separate them. Uh, so this is the, uh, the other scenario that we, we would like to consider. Uh, if all of them are kind of matched uh, based on their interest, so by default, they are kind of having the same amount of interest of attending the event, uh, then in that case, the phone call will basically play the role of uh, affecting the, uh, the decision making. And in most of the studies, this, this uh, influence, what we call, is actually the combination of two things. First, exposure, so I tell you the event. Second, my experience will basically uh, affect uh, what, what you do uh, in, in the future. Uh, usually, in most of the studies, we don't separate e exposure and, uh, and the actual influence. So that, that's also the case here. Um, uh, OK, so to do this, basically, uh, our idea is to uh, kind of uh, um, use an uh, idea similar to the randomized experiment. Uh, so we, we do a, a matched sample estimation where propensity score matching. So some of you might have heard about this concept. The, the basic idea is that the propensity score is the uh, likelihood of being treated uh, given a set of covariates. So in this case, the, li the treatment is basically receiving a phone call. Uh, the um, covariates in this case obviously would be the, let's say, individual preferences by default how much they like music or something else. Uh, so the idea here is basically to uh, pair the individuals that have a very similar propensity score uh, uh, such that we kind of mimic the treatment assignment uh, in randomized experiments to remove selection bias. Uh, so uh, typically, how, uh, the way that we match people are based on uh, demographic information, age, gender, like this, stratification. Uh, in this case, um, we would like to explore some new options. Uh, um, basically, what we looked at is the revealed preferences uh, of individuals uh, through their uh, mobile phone uh, uh, traces, so a mobility history. So there is a, a, a series of uh, revealed preferences in economics that, or especially in uh, business and marketing, uh, which says that uh, uh, 
your uh, preferences is sometimes revealed by what you do, like this, uh, the products that you buy, for example. Uh, so in this case, we, we uh, basically uh, look at the uh, uh, mobility histories, which means the frequencies of the people uh, visiting different locations in the past. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, the fact that they visit different locations will kind of capture their interest in the hidden uh, way. Yeah, please. So is this because you didn't have information on observed demographics, or this is in addition to the observed demographics? Uh, so, so first, uh, we don't have demographics here, that's true. Second, um, demographics, they also have limitations. For example, they are, they are, they are uh, static information. They are not dynamic. Uh, so uh, what we hope here is basically to see whether this kind of more dynamic uh, representation of the preferences uh, can lead to a better uh, matching based method. And uh, I think we have partial demographic information in this case, maybe gender, I'm not completely sure. So we did some simple comparison to see whether there is a difference or not. Uh, but the main uh, motivation of using this kind of new co in some sense is to actually uh, condition the matching based on the actual behavior of the person in the past rather than some static information like demographics. And, but so obviously individual mobility history is, is very, so how do you sort of decide how much further back in the past? Oh uh, yeah, so in this case, we just look at the past six months. Uh, so here you can see, basically we have these uh, uh, little cells. Oh, sorry. They're, they're basically uh, like uh, uh, cell towers. Uh, so. Uh, we just look at the frequency uh, of the person visiting different places. So you can see in this case, uh, the person on the left is more explorative because he goes to different places, more or less equal uh, uh, frequency. Uh, the person on the right is more exploitative because he, he constantly go back to the, the single location that he likes. So um, this gives us an idea uh, of uh, uh, how to basically uh, link uh, this type of uh, uh, behavior, which is reflected in the past uh, uh, history, uh, to the likelihood of uh, doing something, in this case, like uh, uh, attending an event. Uh, so, but obviously, there's no good answer how much you should look back so that you capture the, the, the kind of uh, genuine behavior of the person. In these um, kind of spatial things, did you focus on weekend time? To, if, if the person on the left, maybe their job just takes them around. It's mostly we, weekend. Weekend. Yeah, it's mostly weekend uh, mobility. Yeah. Which we hope captures the leisure <laughs> related activities. Um, so at the same time, we also want to study the effect of influence with respect to the communication distance. So I, I introduced uh, the concept of hope index, which is like how uh, far away, in some sense, you are from uh, attendee. Uh, because maybe you don't receive a direct information, but maybe you receive the information from a friend who received a phone call from the person who attended. And maybe the information got propagated. So that's, in fact, uh, the main motivation uh, of the study. Uh, for that reason, we basically have one treatment group for each HOPE index. So that means for people who receive the phone calls directly from the attendee, we basically put them as a treatment group. And then we, uh, take, uh, we construct a corresponding control group from the people who are outside of the cascade. Uh, but conditioned uh, on the um, fact that uh, the propensity score will be similar based on their uh, past mobility history. So we just pair them like that. Uh, and if we do that, then basically the difference in future adoption rate will establish an um, uh, upper bound of social influence effect after you control the homophily. Please. Is this, um, so wait, so this only works if you have the same call records from the same company for everyone, right? Uh, so like if I, if I call you and you call her, but her is, but she's not in our phone company, you can't see what she's yeah. doing afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the hope is that, uh, well, in this case, because there is only a single network provider in the country, uh, also with high uh, penetra penetration rate, uh, but, but in a country where you have more than one network provider, then, then obviously what you see uh, it's true because I think the, uh, in that case, uh, most of the providers will only have a market of 20, 30 percent of the people. So it's kind of the, uh, uh, it's larger scale than surveys, but still it's a kind of a, a, a 
biased in some ways. Right, so this is only based in Andorra, and yeah. then in Andorra there's only one provider, so... Mostly, mostly, yeah. We have people from France and Spain, but mostly in Andorra. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. And, and that it connects to that. So do these people say, you know what, you can have information on my call data or... Uh, sorry, could you explain yeah, do again these the question? people give permission? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the assumption is that when they basically sign the mobile phone contract, then, then they uh, give the permission uh, to this kind of study. But I think that's a, uh, that's a big question that we can discuss yeah. uh, separately because that's related to, to the ethical concerns and the privacy. Yeah, and I'm quite interested. I think an implicit assumption you're making is that when somebody makes a phone call, we just assume that they are talking about the concept. Uh, that's right, because you can never actually uh, track the content. So you don't know if actually they talked about the event or not. So you're there, you, uh, we are just you assuming. Assume that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is kind of one of the limitations that we can talk in the end, because uh, you don't carry out the survey, therefore you don't know exactly what they, I mean, you can't track the, the content of the call. So. Uh, so it's an upper bound of social influence because obviously there are many different uh, unobserved variables that may affect uh, adoption, such as like offline TV advertisement or uh, you know everything that you observe on the street or something like that. Um, so uh, so yeah, so here I said uh, I said that we we have one treatment group for each hop index because we want to understand whether this uh, uh, influence uh, differs. Uh, for, for people who are of different distance from the uh, original attendee. Um, and then basically we have this, uh, um, um, in fact, uh, a treatment effect uh, for uh, each hop, uh, as I just defined. So what we see here basically is a curve where the x-axis is the hop index, so that means the uh, uh, distance away from the initial uh, attendee. Uh, the y-axis is the difference, uh, is the uh, difference in the uh, likelihood of attending uh, the event in the future uh, divided by the uh, likelihood uh, of attending uh, by the people in the control group, uh, which is basically estimated using uh, logistic regression. So uh, that basically means, this number here means that if you received a, um, a phone call directly from an attendee, uh, then you are 150% more likely to, attend, uh, to, to adopt it in the future compared to a person who uh, who has not been influenced. Uh, so the first thing that we see is obviously uh, we see a positive uh, effect of social influence. That's kind of uh, if, uh, expected. Uh, but it's mostly uh, dramatically for the uh, direct contact, uh, which makes sense. So if you receive a direct phone call, then, then, then that presumably gives a strong uh, uh, influence. Um, but we also see that uh, this uh, effect remains significant uh, for uh, people who are further away. So we are mostly talking about the uh, blue curve here uh, for the moment. So you see that it, it uh, remains significant even uh, to three or ho uh, four hops away in this case, uh, which indicates that um, the influence of the initial adopter uh, reaches far beyond the immediate circle. Uh, it can even uh, uh, influence people who are, uh, they probably don't know. Uh, so uh, to understand the robustness of the results, we also did some uh, tests. Uh, the first uh, is basically to do exactly the same thing, but without controlling for homophily. So that means we don't match people uh, based on uh, the past mobility history. If you do that, you, you observe this uh, uh, purple curve. Uh, it's a random matching. Uh, you see the overestimation, and uh, the, the overestimation is uh, mostly due to homophily, and this is uh, almost twice uh, as uh, much. Uh, and this is similar to the founding uh, in this paper uh, in 2009. Uh, the other thing that we, we did is basically to uh, do a shuffling test uh, of the hope, hope index. So if the person is a direct uh, uh, contact, uh, we randomly uh, change that number from one to five or six like that. And after that, we again do the matching. So uh, the purpose of doing this is basically to see whether some uh, uh, unobserved variables were lead to the decay patterns that we see. Uh, but the red curve basically shows that there is no such pattern, uh, so uh, the observed result is not likely to be mainly driven by uh, something that we don't observe. Uh, so to understand how this uh, um, 
uh, pattern uh, decay. So what is the mechanism that leads to this decaying uh, uh, effect of social influence? Uh, we build a simple Bayesian model to, to, to understand it. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, in a communication cascade, uh, an individual will basically update her estimation of the uh, product. So the product is uh, defined broadly. It's uh, whatever that you want to adopt. It can be a mu uh, app, or it can be a piece of music, or whether you want to attend the event or not. Uh, so an individual will update her uh, estimation of the product characteristics, so uh, what is the event like, uh, things like that, after they uh, talk to the uh, uh, people uh, um, around him uh, or her. Uh, and then after that, they will dynamically uh, update the estimate uh, by aggregating information from the neighbors. Uh, so uh, then we assume that this estimation, together with the person's own preference by default, uh, will basically form an evaluation of, uh, of the person for the event. So if the person estimates uh, the event is kind of like uh, a pop music event with uh, 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 a huge crowd, and then his own preference is basically he likes uh, these large-scale events, and then he will together use these two pieces of information to form uh, his own evaluation, which is this is the event that I, I like to go. Uh, and then he will basically make the uh, adoption decision following a simple Bernoulli uh, probability distribution. Uh, so the estimation is uh, basically done uh, uh, like here. So Greg basically received a phone call from Bob, and then he will basically update his estimation based on uh, the evaluation of Bob uh, and the fact that he knows that Bob likes certain things. Uh, and then basically uh, this will uh, keep, go uh, keep going like that. Um, and then uh, after a while, we could basically see the estimation of the uh, event uh, by all the individuals. And then we can see how this estimation uh, basically change uh, when we move uh, further away uh, from the initial uh, adopter. Uh, so what we uh, measure here is the difference in the estimation between the individual uh, who are in the cascade uh, and the initial adopter. Uh, so the x axis here is again the distance, the hope index. The y is basically the uh, mean squared uh, difference between the evaluation. What you see here is that this difference increases uh, as uh, the hope index increases. So this could mean uh, the, uh, the estimation of the uh, event uh, become uh, less accurate and contains more bios uh, because the estimation of individuals contain bios and these bios can accumulate uh, along the information cascade and uh, also uh, the fact that you receive uh, influence from multiple people uh, can also uh, have this aggregation effect. So in the end, you, uh, uh, people here, they have a less accurate estimation of the event uh, which might be related to the decaying pattern of the influence. Uh, in this case. But this is still something that we want to investigate further. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a, a conjecture uh, that we hope to test further. Uh, so the main uh, uh, findings in this study is that first we, we, um, we um, try to use the revealed preferences instead of uh, uh, static uh, demographics as covariance uh, to uh, quantify the influence in uh, a matching-based uh, uh, estimation. Uh, and, and we think this can uh, actually overcome a lot of uh, uh, difficulties in traditional RCT-based approaches, because uh, uh, sometimes, uh, for privacy reasons, you don't have the uh, covariates that you like. Uh, sometimes you have, but they remain static. So you can't uh, capture the uh, dynamic changes if there are. Uh, the empirical finding is that uh, we observe this long-range effect of social influence, uh, which uh, may have implications in um, scenarios like uh, viral marketing or public health management, uh, when you try to basically use uh, offline communication to um, influence uh, people's decision making in these uh, situations. Um, the limitations are mostly uh, the identification of the initial adopters is not uh, precise because we don't really know whether the person attend or not. We just know that the person uh, had some phone uh, uh, activities uh, within a very small range uh, from the venue of the event. Uh, but we didn't actually ask the people, so we don't know whether they actually uh, attended or they just passed by. Please. Uh, 
So to come back to this point about matching versus on, on static demographics versus yeah. the more dynamic ones, uh, dynamic characteristics, I mean, to some extent, dynamic mm. attributes, there's a certain endogeneity there because things that are changing mm. are they could be changing because people are themselves being influenced mm -hmm. themselves yeah. and we don't really observe that influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do we, so while I'm sympathetic to your point, I also kind of wonder about that issue of endogeneity of the fact that mobility itself reflects influence mm. processes that are happening. I go to this museum yeah. because someone told me to go to that yeah, yeah. museum. Yeah, I think that's uh, true. Uh, I, I didn't present a uh, result where we basically compare the two different uh, uh, matching. One is based on demographics, the other is based on demographics plus uh, the mobility history. Uh, and the results are mostly similar, which makes us think like uh, the mobility history is contained the information of uh, the demographics in some sense. Uh, but this by itself is a very interesting question to ask, like whether uh, these observed the behavior, to which extent they capture the, the static attributes uh, that we use uh, in the traditional case. Uh, but more importantly, if you are not allowed to collect this kind of demographics, uh, then, then, then this can be more useful. Um, another obvious thing is that uh, there might exist a multiple treatment effect where you receive multiple phone calls. But right now, the distance that we define is basically the shortest distance to the attendee. So, uh, so obviously, uh, that's something that we can do further. Uh, but the, the main idea is that given a social network, in this case, we want to see how this influence play a role and how it can propagate, basically. Uh, but in some cases, you don't observe this uh, communication network, uh, but you, we just observe the, the adoption behavior of people. So they, they decide to do something. Yes. Yeah, so could you speak a bit more about how the estimate of the product was done? because you calculated a mean square difference. So I guess these estimates were actual numbers and what went into the calculation of these? Yeah, so, so they were initialized as uh, uh, following a certain distribution. And then after that, let's say, if you uh, call me, uh, then basically you will uh, have your uh, estimation, which leads to your evaluation. Uh, and we also assume that each person has an initial vector of uh, uh, preferences. So based on what I receive from you, I will basically just use a Bayesian rule to compute the posterior of my estimation conditioned on the fact that I observe the information from you. Okay. Uh, so it's basically, uh, the posterior is basically the prior, proportional to the prior times the likelihood. The prior is basically my original, uh, uh, sorry, the prior is basically the estimation from the past timestamp. Uh, the likelihood is basically uh, what is the, uh, likelihood uh, of uh, this given estimation such that it leads to the information that I received from you. Uh, so you just uh, uh, um, simulate all these uh, quantities uh, by putting uh, distributions on top of them and then you just compute. Okay. Yeah. So this um, estimate is sort of an average of the vector? Is that what uh, it's a vector. It's the vector? It's a vector, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. And then distance is basically uh, square the dis distant difference between the vectors. Yeah. Uh, so the second question that we want to ask, which is kind of uh, um, conceptually uh, the reverse of the problem, uh, if you observe some um, uh, adoption actions or whatever actions, uh, what could be the unobserved social network that leads to these uh, actions? Uh, we will use a slightly different uh, framework here, which is based on game theory. Uh, so we are going to make a small transition here, but the, the conceptual uh, uh, question is the reverse of the first one that we ask. Uh, so let's uh, start with uh, some simple examples. Consider a group of students making choice on educational efforts. So how much uh, time you, sp uh, you want to put to, to, to uh, a certain study. Uh, so they will basically follow a, a number of rules. The first rule will be the making effort is costly, obviously, for me. Uh, but I will benefit from my own effort, obviously. And in this case, I will also benefit from my friend's eff uh, effort because it's a, a collective study. It's a course project so it's like that. Uh, so if we uh, uh, have this kind of rules, then uh, the person will tend to put more effort if uh, the friends of the person put more effort. So uh, one uh, scenario could be this, where the colors um, uh, define how much effort they want to put in. So you see the person on the, uh, here, he puts a lot of effort because many of his friends put a lot of effort. And the opposite is true for this blue guy. Uh, 
Um, a second example uh, is to uh, consider a group of students and making choice to uh, buy a book, whether each individual wants to buy a book or not. Uh, obviously, in this case, buying a book is costly. Uh, it costs time and money. Uh, so if a friend of mine will buy, then I will not buy, based on the assumption that I can easily borrow. Uh, but if none of my friends will buy, then I would buy because I definitely need the book. Uh, so if we have this kind of rules, then uh, we are likely to end up in a situation like this. Uh, the red guys, they decide to buy a book because none of their uh, neighbors uh, decide to buy. Uh, and the blue guys, they don't buy because at least one neighbor uh, bought the book. So this is another scenario. Uh, in both of the scenarios, you can see that there is, exists a strategic interactions between uh, people, uh, uh, which can be modeled as games. Uh, game theory is basically mathematical uh, models of rational decision making between uh, individuals. Um, usually, it contains uh, key concepts such as a player, uh, the actions. Uh, the actions can be binary, whether by a book or not. Uh, it can also be continuous, like uh, the amount of effort that you put. Um, the payoff is basically uh, how much reward you got uh, following your action. Uh, what is, uh, so all the, uh, these concepts, they remain uh, in what we call uh, game zone uh, networks. Uh, but uh, for the uh, concept here, we have an additional uh, uh, information, which is the interaction network, so friendship network, for example. Uh, so the interesting idea here would be to see how the in individual actions uh, can be related to the structure of the network. So I can give you an example in the previous cases. If you are central in the network, you are well connected, then obviously that will affect how much effort that you put uh, in a, a course project or whether you are going to buy a book or not. So the uh, relationship between the individual decision making and the structure of the network uh, is the most in uh, interesting aspect in these models of uh, games on networks. Um, obviously, the basic assumption is that the payoff of one individual will depends on not, uh, her action, uh, but also the uh, uh, actions of the neighbors. Uh, so uh, the two things that we uh, talked about are actually examples of uh, what we call strategic complements and the substitute. Uh, so uh, I think this is quite uh, self-explanatory. Uh, so um, there are many studies uh, dedicated to this uh, field which is a subfield of economics. Um, economics people uh, look at the equilibrium uh, of games played on networks um, on a given or preferred network. They're mostly interested in how action and payoff depends on the network structure. Uh, in computer science, the same ideas is uh, studied under the name of graphical games. Uh, what they're interested in um, is mostly to develop algorithms to compute the equilibrium. Uh, in a computational sense. Uh, so what we are more interested in this work is uh, a reverse problem, which is trying to infer the network uh, given the conditions that we observe. Uh, so we don't assume that we have a, a network, but we assume that people play games uh, in a, a hidden uh, network, and we want to basically recover that structure. Uh, you can find a lot of examples. We observe individual decisions, adoptions, but not social networks. Uh, we observe the, the research and the development activities of firms, but we don't uh, observe the collaboration network of firms. Or uh, policies of countries, uh, but not uh, the political alliances. So, uh, obviously, the, the, the difficulty here is the complexity of the network, which makes the inference more difficult. Uh, uh, as a result, we have to uh, kind of put some uh, structure to the game. Uh, Otherwise, it will be very difficult to make any inference. Uh, the specific uh, structure, I mean, the, the a broad definition could be the payoff of a player UI is basically a function of his own action AI, uh, AJ, which are the actions of his neighbors in the unobserved network. Uh, 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 or in this case, we can say it's observed network. Uh, and then the connectivity, basically. So one particular. Uh, formulation of the payoff is this uh, linear quadratic model. Uh, it's quite easy to understand. Here we have individual actions, AI, uh, and then we have this marginal benefit, BI, which basically decides, uh, independent, from, uh, independent from the others, uh, if I increase my action, how much uh, benefit I will get. Uh, then we have this network factor, beta, uh, 
uh, in front of this term. So this term we can basically think about is the AI times the summation uh, of uh, the neighbor's uh, action. Uh, so you can clearly see that the first two terms correspond to a kind of individual effort. This is the individual benefit. This is the cost. It's a negative squared term. And then this term is basically uh, the network effect. So if you have a lot of people um, uh, who are your neighbors, and then if they all have a very high AJ, uh, then you know if you put a high a AI, then it will increase your own uh, uh, utility. So uh, that's basically uh, one specific model that we use. And why do we choose this uh, specific function, uh, pair of function first? It's a continuous. Uh, it can capture continuous actions. The A doesn't have to be uh, discrete. Where in many cases the A's are, are assumed to be discrete. Uh, in uh, the literature. Uh, also, it's very easy for us to uh, capture both strategic complements and a substitute. We just need to choose a positive beta or negative beta. So negative beta will basically mean that uh, there is a kind of a, a negative uh, network effect. Um, and this is a, a simple quadratic model, but uh, it can also be used to approximate more uh, uh, complex nonlinear payoffs. So that also uh, makes it uh, general. Um, and this is also a well uh, ad adopted model in the literature uh, of uh, uh, games on networks. Uh, again, we have a lot of examples that I just uh, gave before that can suit these games. You can think about educational effort, collaboration, uh, or even individual mobility choices uh, in the context of urban dynamics. Uh, so let's. Uh, uh, focus on the most uh, important advantage of this uh, specific model. Uh, in game theory, we were mostly interested in equilibrium. Uh, so what is the kind of uh, uh, a stable situation uh, where a person will not uh, tend to make a change of his action if none of his neighbors will change? So the concept of uh, Nash equilibrium is uh, uh, to capture uh, this uh, stable situation. Uh, in this case, uh, the equilibrium is easy to derive. We can simply take the first order uh, condition of uh, stability. So we take the derivative of this uh, utility uh, with respect to the individual action. Uh, and then we end up in an equation here. So B here is basically a vector of in, uh, the marginal benefit, if you remember. Uh, the A is a vector of actions. So you see that the actions A is uh, basically uh, the inverse of this matrix times B. Um, so uh, we need a few assumptions to, to guarantee that this uh, inversion exists, uh, which is basically the spectrum radius of this matrix is smaller than 1. Um, uh, the spectrum radius is basically the largest uh, uh, single uh, value uh, of, the, uh, of the matrix. Uh, if that's the case, then you can guarantee the matrix inversion exists. Uh, and uh, the equilibrium is uh, unique and unstable. So that's just some uh, technical conditions. Uh, but if we observe uh, this uh, um, equilibrium uh, more carefully, we can, we can find something interesting. This uh, uh, inversion can be uh, rewritten as an uh, uh, infinite sum uh, of the terms here. So bit uh, p, g, p. Um, and this is closely related to a concept in network science, which is called the case uh, Bonasic centrality, uh, that just counts the uh, total number of uh, uh, walks uh, from one single person to anybody in the network. Uh, so um, uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, if you look at the uh, payoff function here, it looks like uh, this uh, payoff interdependency uh, only exists in one hope neighbor. But if you look at the equation here, actually you see that under the equilibrium, this uh, payoff dependency spreads indirectly through the whole network. Uh, which is something interesting uh, to observe. And you can also have some other interpretation from a more signal processing viewpoint, but I will skip that because probably that's not very uh, easy to explain in a short period of time. Um, but under this model, we basically come up with a learning algorithm uh, that helps us to basically infer the G from the A. So that's the, the, the idea that we had uh, from the beginning. And we, we basically consider uh, K independent games, uh, all of them have different uh, uh, marginal benefit vectors. So you can think about the diff uh, adoption of different types of products. Uh, the marginal benefits for each of them will be different for individuals. Therefore, the equilibrium actions will be different. But the, uh, the network is uh, assumed to be the same. Uh, 
so uh, we um, try to um, infer the network structure G uh, and together uh, with the marginal benefit B uh, given only the action A and the uh, parameter beta. Uh, what we do is to uh, solve this following uh, optimization problem. Uh, the first term here we can see uh, is just a, a condition that is met when the equilibrium of the action uh, is observed. So you want to minimize this term so that it basically means that your action is close to your equilibrium. Uh, then we want to put some other conditions on the variable that we want to optimize for. The, the uh, G is basically the network structure, so we, we want it to be symmetric, non-active, um, and then also constrained on the total uh, sum of the weights of the edges. Uh, this just guarantees that the variable that we solve in the end is a valid graph topology a structure. Uh, we also need some uh, constraint or uh, prior information on this B, uh, the marginal benefits. Uh, the simple thing that we consider is, again, um, an idea taken from uh, this uh, idea of homophily. Uh, so two people are likely to form a link uh, if they have a similar uh, characteristic. Uh, this characteristic here is, in fact, the marginal benefit. So you like music. Uh, therefore, uh, taking certain actions will lead to a higher payoff, for example. So, if we think of this uh, uh, um, marginal benefit as a single value, let's say instead of a vector, we just think of it like a single value, and then we represent that value as a bar in the network. So, the, the, um, the bars that are uh, upwards are positive, uh, the, the blue ones, they are negative. So, in this case, because uh, two people will form uh, likely to form a link if their uh, marginal benefits are similar. Therefore, if you look at this uh, uh, information, which is the marginal benefits on uh, top of this network, you will see that the transitions of these values will be kind of smooth across the edges, because that's based on the assumption that a link will only form between people who have similar attributes. Right? So uh, in computer science, you can use a, a term, which is this thing, uh, based on what is called the Laplace matrix of the network uh, to quantify this. This basically says that uh, if uh, there is a connection Gij, which is non-zero, then I want Bi and Bj to be similar. Uh, so uh, in our context, we use this term here, which basically means we assume a kind of a homophilous uh, distribution of the marginal benefit. Uh, and then after we have this term, uh, we can basically solve this problem uh, uh, using specific uh, uh, computational methods, uh, which I will probably not talk too much. Um, basically, it's be uh, you have this joint uh, uh, variable G and B, uh, which leads to a non-convex optimization, but you can use uh, alternating minimization to solve uh, all of, uh, both of them iteratively. Yes? Um, just to like probably over oversimplify a lot of this, but just because not yeah, anyways, um, so part of it is that you have the same network, but you're training the algorithm because there's a variation in the marginal benefit of different yeah. different yeah. products. Yeah, say. that's right. So you're saying, I have the same network many, many times, but yeah, different yeah. products within yeah. it, and then I'm trying to guess a person's position within yeah, yeah. the network. Yeah, based yeah. On that's right. That. Yeah. Okay. It can be extended to cases where networks are changing. But right now, we just consider a fixed topology, but uh, different uh, marginal benefits. And did you put any constraints on the different types of network, like the topology of the networks that you're uh, That's a very good question. Right now, we don't, because this constraint is very general. Uh, it's the basic constraint that guarantees a valid uh, network topology. Uh, you can put things like uh, a degree distribution or other things, uh, which we studied in the experiments, but now we don't put them in the co uh, constraint explicitly. You can, if you have some, you know, uh, prior information about something, and then you try to put that as a constraint. Uh, the in basic intuition is that if this uh, spectrum radius uh, rho beta g uh, is zero, then obviously you know you don't have any information of the network from A because you just get A minus B, right? So so there is no hope that you can infer uh, the the g from from the A. Uh, but if this uh, beta g uh, becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, then obviously A will contain the information from the network. The extreme case, if beta G uh, has a radius of 1, uh, then we can work out that this action is proportional to the eigenvector centrality. Uh, 
uh, of the network. And that eigenvector centrality, in fact, uh, has strong information about the, the connectivity of the network. Uh, so that, that's kind of an intuition why from uh, action A, we can go back to, to get the, the topology uh, G. Uh, so we uh, tested this idea in uh, both uh, synthetic and real world data. Uh, so, so these are basically the uh, different uh, types of topologies that you mentioned. These are random graph models that are typically studied in uh, network science. Uh, they basically capture different types of connectivities. Uh, and uh, what we do is basically to first to generate a uh, ground truth random uh, network. Uh, then we basically use this uh, uh, idea to compute an action uh, based on a simulation of the homophilus um, uh, marginal benefits, which is assumed to be a Gaussian distribution here. Uh, so we get the G, we compute the B uh, following this, and then we get A, and then we just use the algorithm to infer G and B from A. So that's the basic uh, procedure. Um, and now we basically compare it with some other uh, like uh, well-known methods in computer science mostly, uh, and they evaluate the performance. Uh, this is one uh, set of experiments that we do. Uh, each figure is basically one type of random graph. Mm, what we observe here, uh, the x-axis is the spectrum radius uh, of the beta G matrix, and the y is the evaluation, uh, which is the similarity between what we infer and the ground truth that we start with. So you can see that the, when we increase the spectrum radius, the performance increases, uh, which follows the intuition that I just explained. Um, and uh, the, the method that we have here uh, uh, in general, achieves a, a better performance than uh, a simple baseline, which is sample correlation, uh, and also another well-known method in computer science, um, which is called a graphical lasso. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but uh, the idea is to uh, see uh, whether this new formulation can uh, actually improve the performance compared to some existing models. Uh, the more interesting question in this case would be whether the algorithm works equally well to infer different types of graphs, like graphs of different uh, connectivity. Uh, so to do that, basically we test it uh, uh, for these three different types of graph. Each of these random graph models have parameters to decide the densities of the edges. So for example, in the uh, Odo Shirani uh, network, uh, edges are created independently uh, with uh, uh, given uh, probability distribution. Uh, so if the P is high, uh, then the network becomes dense. Uh, Another example would be uh, this uh, uh, Barbash Arbert network, uh, which is a generative model. Uh, at each time, you just add a new vertex and then connect that new vertex to the existing nodes in the graph. So if you decide every time you put m new nodes, that means every time you just add m new edges. Uh, and the rule is that you only connect yourself uh, the new nodes to the nodes that are already well uh, connected. Uh, so that in the end you uh, have this uh, prefer uh, preferential attachment uh, scheme. Uh, so there are just different networks, but what we observe here is that when these parameters are high, uh, which leads to uh, denser networks, the performance drops. Um, and one reason for that could be uh, if you have a very dense network, then the connections uh, basically have uh, this uh, uh, influence, which are uh, uh, kind of mingled against, uh, with each other, so it becomes very difficult for you to uh, recover. Uh, from uh, just uh, the observed actions. If the network is sparse, then the likely uh, um, correlation between the actions uh, indicates more the existence of a link. So that's the basic intuition. Uh, we also did some real-world uh, data uh, to infer, uh, so the, in this case, it's an inference of a social network structure where the data basically are the almost 200 households in the village in rural India. This is one classical study mm -hmm. in economics. Um, the games in this case uh, are <laughs> basically the number of facilities adopted by each uh, household. And so it's uh, arguably a, a strategic complement game because of the uh, conformity to social norms will basically lead to higher benefits in the village. Um, and then uh, we basically take the data, which is the actions, and then get the social network and compare that with uh, uh, self-reported uh, social network to see how it works. So in this case, we can get some good performance uh, better than the uh, baseline. Uh, the other example is uh, to infer a trade network. Uh, 
So that's a similar idea. Uh, but slight, the, the slight difference is that in this case, it's more like a strategic substitute instead of uh, uh, a complement. Uh, but the basic idea is to uh, observe uh, actions which are import export, uh, export of countries. Uh, and we want to see whether that can infer, uh, help us to infer a trade network uh, that we don't observe. Uh, so that's basically a high level idea. Uh, so again, here, uh, I think the interesting thing would be uh, the application in the practical scenarios. If you only observe the actions but not the network, then obviously if you can infer the network, you can use it to detect the communities, which is useful for stratification. Uh, you can compute centrality measures, which can, which can help you to design uh, targeting uh, interventions. Uh, and uh, you can basically achieve uh, planning objectives by looking at the network. So the two, two examples here could be if you want to maximize the total utility of the players, uh, then uh, you can adjust the marginal benefits that you learned uh, so that it is proportional to the eigenvector centrality, which is proven in this paper. Uh, you can think about reducing inequality between different players, like different communities in the city, uh, by adjusting the uh, connections between the different communities after you infer it. So you can encourage new links and uh, dis discourage existing links. Uh, there are several open issues here. Uh, the de determination of the parameter beta, um, the theoretical understanding of the algorithm, when it works, with what guarantee. That's more like a, uh, mm, a guarantee that we would like to have so that we can actually apply it in a uh, real world uh, scenario. Uh, and then, obviously, mm, other uh, payoff functions or uh, applications. Uh, so the high level idea here is, uh, kind of opposite to the first problem that I talked. If we observe certain actions, uh, can we uh, try to basically go back to infer the hidden links uh, between them? Uh, so these two basically uh, combine together um, in a sense that uh, I think uh, collective decision making is key to understand the behavior. Um, and the network-based learning can provide some natural uh, models and tools to do that. Uh, the, the, the caveat here is more like the learning and inference, they need to be uh, done uh, in combination with social theories uh, for better interpretability. Uh, ad, uh, otherwise, uh, they just become a, a computer science exercise uh, without uh, the implications in, in uh, policy making. Uh, more importantly, you need to think about the ethical implications and consequences uh, when you build models to understand human behavior. Uh, it might lead to marginalization of some uh, disadvantaged groups. Uh, in some sense or situation. So um, you need to be basically extra careful uh, when you make these modeling assumptions. Uh, but that basically needs help from social scientists uh, to work uh, in a more like collaborative setting. Um, yeah, so finally, there are a few papers and the, the, the co authors of these papers. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and take the question. Um, <laughs> one of my questions, well, just for clarity's sake, um, if you wanted to infer the, the, the location of, of someone in a network, do you, in using your method, do you need to know what the network sh like topology is first to be able to identify where they are in that topology, just because your games held topology constant, right? Uh, no, I think you just need to, to observe these uh, actions, which are vectors. Okay. And then basically you get a, a, what is called a adjacency matrix, right? Right. right. And that adjacency matrix basically captures the connectivity pattern. Okay. So you don't need the. You don't need the network topology eventually. Uh, yeah, that's basically what you want to infer. Okay. So who is connected? Not just the who? individual location, but the entire topology of the network. Uh, so I yeah. So the, in some sense, I think the, the location of the network is doesn't matter that much because you can redraw the network in whatever way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so so they just. Uh, uh, I think they depend on the specific uh, layout of the graph, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, the, the main information is basically whether A is connected to B. Okay. Uh, so whether there is an existence of that link. Okay. Uh, that's completely captured by the adjacency matrix. So we infer that just from the vectorial observation of actions. Okay. And, and just following up on that, a lot of what we've been discussing lately is that with digital trace data, uh -huh. we 
of we don't know what we're missing sometimes. Uh -huh. And this method seems like it could be one way to start getting at that in the context of social network data. Uh, we could try, yeah. Yeah. Although this particular method is based on the assumption of network games, which means that the, the actions people take are kind of based on strategic interactions. Yeah. Uh, so mobility is whether they... So there is an uh, interesting example in urban dynamics that can fit this, um, which is, uh, think about an uh, uh, artificial city where we only have two locations. One is the center, the other is the periphery. Uh, now everybody needs to basically decide how many times they go to the city center uh, for social benefits, like by interacting with the others. So in that case, the number of visits is basically the action. Uh, and then you obviously want to uh, visit more if you are central in the social network because there is a high likelihood that you interact with more people. So in that uh, specific scenario, you can think of uh, uh, inferring this uh, hidden social network connection uh, from the action, which is the number of uh, uh, visits they paid to the city center. Uh, I guess if uh, the digital traces can fit into something like that, like the fact that I moved to a certain place is, is uh, likely to be affected by the fact that you also go to the same place, uh, then, then it might be possible to do this. Because my action will not just depend on my own action, but also your action, right? Does it make sense? Hi, th thank you for the, yeah. for the talk. I, I was wondering about um, uh, the first uh, piece we're talking about yeah. on the, the, the network through uh, telephone. Yeah. Uh, whether you could infer some uh, alternative demographics by just looking how people call. Uh, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think there are people who do that. Uh, I have some colleagues who uh, try to use uh, uh, communication patterns. Uh, mostly in what is called the ego network, so it's just me and the, the first uh, hope neighbors of myself uh, to infer demographics. Um, you can do that with reasonable accuracy. Uh, what the results I see are usually like uh, between 70 and 80 percent accuracy. Uh, it seems that even without making the link explicitly to demographics, uh -huh. it in itself would be interesting to maybe do some clustering on just the type of communicate yeah, communicators. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. I think these kind of predictions are based on that. So, for example, females and males have different communication patterns uh, during the weekdays and weekends. Yeah. So that's how they, they predict that. So getting back to your point, if you don't have uh, demographics, maybe you can use that to predict and then use that to condition the matching. Uh, but there is one actual step in the middle that you don't guarantee that uh, the, the, the prediction is perfect. On the other hand, you can use social media activities to predict I think Scott Hale from OII did something recently. Uh, they just look at Twitter activities and then use that to predict demographics, I think. It's kind of similar idea. Um, so I'm wondering in your inference of the network topology, do you, uh, you had, in this case, you had this kind of quadratic function, payoff yeah. function, but I guess it's quite general to different kinds of, of uh, mm. payoff functions. Yeah. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to understand perhaps variations where, um, ha have you thought or have you built, have you tried to infer, do this with other payoff functions as well to try and see how it, how it looks like or? Mm, um, yeah, so Dan says that we haven't really tried other uh, payoff functions. The, the thing is that uh, first, we want it to be general enough. Second, uh, the equilibrium needs to be explicitly computable. Uh, because we want to have this notion of uh, Nash equilibrium actions. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, an arbitrary analytical function of the payoff, as long as you can pay, uh, take the first order derivative, you can still fit into the optimization. But in that case, there is no economic theory to guarantee that the equilibrium will be uh, stable and uh, unique, which means you kind of lose something from the uh, economic interpretation, yeah. right? So yeah. one of the things that we've discussed a lot in the Summer Institute is is that some of these very detailed um, uh, types of data that you've talked about, for example, mobile networks, calling networks, yeah. um, uh, or, or other forms of, of rich behavioral data are often in the hands of private companies and, and hard to get access to. Mm. Um, and while 
they're very they can shed light in new kinds of ways as you've shown in your talk mm. um perhaps you could comment a bit on 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 your experiences trying to access these kinds of data especially for example the mobile study in andorra mm. um and what were the steps or 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 the pathways that enabled you to get access to them because i think it would be helpful for us here as well to know about yeah that andorra study i think uh was based on a kind of a contract uh, signed between a few groups in the Media Lab and the government of Andorra. Mm. Uh, because at the time they were trying to diversify the uh, economy uh, and then uh, trying to attract more tourists, basically. And then understand whether they can keep them to stay overnight, basically, so that they can. Uh, and they have some huge problems in terms of traffic jams. Uh, so, so they basically. Um, want to work uh, with uh, a few groups in the Media Lab to uh, build new models uh, first to solve these problems, but they also want to uh, make Andorra like a place of innovation in Europe by testing new ideas like these and uh, um, self-driving cars. And that was like uh, five years ago when they were trying to put some vehicles on the street and then see how people react. Uh, in that case, because of that sp special relationship, uh, we get this access few data from the uh, Telecom Andorra, I think. Uh, and m mostly what I know, the way you get uh, access to this kind of data is through this kind of uh, research contracts. Um, but I would say it's more and more common compared to 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was really, really difficult uh, because people did not understand whether it's safe to share it uh, or whether uh, they can actually get some benefit. Uh, but nowadays, I, I would say, specifically for mobile phone data, it becomes more popular mm -hmm. uh, because more and more network providers realize that uh, there is a reasonably good way to share uh, anonymized data uh, to, for some uh, benefits. So uh, I don't know if you know, uh, there is a dedicated conference called NetMob, uh, which actually happens the week after next in Oxford. So that's a dedicated conference for people working on mobile phone data. Uh, so there you can see that they have all sorts of uh, uh, data from different countries. Um, but in general, I think the problem is that uh, the reason why uh, people do not necessarily want to share the data is because of these ethical concerns. Uh, they are not sure whether it will be safe, uh, what would be the best way to share, uh, what is the best way to anonymize. Uh, if they don't know, then it becomes very difficult for them to share. And then if you approach them, then it will be difficult. So. I think the idea would be to, uh, I think people are convinced that, that they are helpful. Uh, but now the thing is that the other side of the development needs to catch up, basically to show that uh, we can have safe and uh, meaningful ways to share uh, the data, uh, which can help us to solve some important problems. I think that can help us convince the data holder mm -hmm. uh, in this case. Uh, but it takes time because like ten, uh, if you compare 10 years ago and now, 10 years ago maybe there are only a, only a few groups in the world that have this kind of data. But now I would say much, much more common. Uh, still, I think uh, uh, it's a kind of a slow process in some ways. Uh, so. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question regarding the the network model that you that you showed um, before. Uh, like when I get the drive with the, the inverse or the power series in the the model, you you get some kind of like a like a temporal process that I'm influencing like my network neighbors and like further neighbors, and it also comes back to me, doesn't it? Like that. Uh, so in this case, so if I understand your question, this is more like a one shot game. So it's not a sequential game. So it's just like. A, I just observed action uh, where people do not know uh, the decision makings of the other people uh, beforehand. So they basically make simultaneous uh, actions. And the network is basically uh, a network structure in a particular time. Okay. So you observe these uh, simultaneous actions, uh, and then you infer a network in a, a given uh, point in time. But it's not sequentially. Uh, down. But wouldn't I be like, like if I just solve the, um, the inverse, um, this inverse te term, yeah. wouldn't I be in there as well? Like, uh, 
like is, isn't that wouldn't it like model kind of like that my effort depends on my effort somehow isn't it? yeah yeah you can yeah, i mean actually it's like there is a loop right so yeah. your your effort depends on the others and the other uh, the others effort depends on the third person it's like that uh, but, but isn't it like only possible in time like if you just model one simultaneously uh not necessarily you can you can basically have these uh, examples that i uh, presented at the beginning uh, where basically we say that uh, say uh, you are in a social network and then uh, you know your neighbors and then in your mind you basically work out like what would be the equilibrium right if i do something i can expect what is the uh, action right so if everybody just uh, if everybody is assumed to be rational they will basically compute this equilibrium in their mind and they would basically make a simultaneous action and then that's the equilibrium you observe basically because the idea of equilibrium is that if the others do not change then uh, i don't have the incentive to change Right? Yeah. But you can generalize it to a sequential setting, I think, where you say, OK, I observed the past joint decision of all the people. And then maybe the network will change in the next timestamp. And maybe the actions will depend on the actions in this new point in time, plus mm -hmm. the game that played in the past. But not here. So. I have another question about data collection. So okay. one of the, I mean, I think like network data are, are things that, of course, are very exciting, but also um, not as 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 widely available as as one would like. Partly because they're difficult to connect data on, hmm. and I and I'm wondering if, um, based on your examples, given that you do a lot of work on you use with networks. It, are there kind of examples of, of good data sets that are also publicly uh, available that, that you know, you'd like to talk or share, let us know about? Because, I mean, this has been recently at Nuffield College, there was a workshop, I think a couple of years ago or last year, which was on sort of the challenges of network data collection and the fact that there are just mm. so few available and often there are maybe very small samples if they are. Mm. Um, and mm. So, and you mentioned that now a lot more data sources are available, especially for networks. So perhaps you could just give us more examples of that or ways mm. to, to leverage those that would be very helpful. Yeah, if you, if you talk about like, for example, real world social network data, yeah. at least in the computer science literature, there are many, many uh, repositories. Uh -huh. uh, I would say you can find all sorts of networks in real world uh, situations, because those are the networks that the computer scientists test their algorithms on. Uh, they can be static, they can be dynamic, they can be directed, they can be for all different types of applications. Uh, I can share a few links, maybe. Um, the more difficult thing would be the data that you mentioned first, yeah. like the more private, yes, uh, yeah, uh, or data that are mm, privately held by companies and governments, that's more difficult. Uh, and that's more difficult also because of the nature of the data, right? which has a, like a higher risk. If you think about a social network, the risk is kind of less because you just have the connections. Uh, if you don't have any other information on the nodes, it's just a, like a graph, it's a matrix. It doesn't really uh, allow any re-identification. Uh, but if you have traces, then, then that's a different story. Right? So. All right. Well, we want to thank Jodan for uh, Jowen for speaking with us. And if you have any more questions, are you coming to lunch with us? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. So he'll come to lunch if you have more questions. Um, and after lunch is just continue to work on your group projects. We'll be sending out soon a little brief on what we would like in the presentations tomorrow. Um, does anyone have any questions? About that? Okay. Lunch. Thank you.